I'm really happy to be here. Um, as Donna said, I am now at Texas A&M University. I did my PhD with Tom Seeley. And I don't know if he talked about house hunting when he was here. When was this, when he came? Five years ago. Oh, five years ago. Well, he spent, or he has spent, the last maybe 40, no, not 40, 30 years uh, working on an island of the coast, uh, coast of Maine, working on um, how hus house hunting in swarms occurs. And he's written now a book, a couple of books, actually, three. No, now it's four books. But the, the one on swarming is called Honeybee Democracy, which I really um, uh, recommend to you guys. But so he did most of the work on how a swarm that's on a tree branch uh, communicates to each other, makes the decision of where to move to their new home and how to move in a kind of a cohesive way. But there was a story left behind or, or that was missing, and that is the preparation that the colony undergoes to leave from the, uh, from the uh, original nest or, call, or yeah, hive to that tree branch. Who gets to go? Huh? Who gets to yeah, who gets to go, how they do it, how they organize it. And so that was the topic of most of my PhD dissertation. Um, so we did six, a total of six projects. And I'm gonna talk to you about uh, two, maybe three if we have time, uh, of those projects. And, and um, there's three more. But the, the cool ones are the ones that I'm gonna talk about because <laughs> they have to do with communication and behavior. And there's a couple of very cool videos that we got to shoot. So um, that's the cool, uh, those are the, the cool um, studies that we did with swarming. But interestingly, uh, as we, as you will see, uh, not surprisingly to honeybees use a lot of signals in the same signals in different contexts, kind of to save energy because they already have this one signal figured out. So they use it under, in different contexts for different messages and that's what <laughs> goes on uh, during swarming. So it's really a neat story. So what, what I'm gonna talk about today, t tomorrow, so I, I should say my, uh, career with honeybees has been mostly focused on reproduction. So I worked with swarming for my PhD. Then I did, um, I was a postdoctoral research fellow at North Carolina State University with David Tarpey, uh, whom is a great speaker as well. If you, if you have a chance to hear him talk, that he's, he's awesome also. And um, he also works with queen uh, reproductive health. So I did uh, three years of research on supersedure and how, or what are the factors that uh, lead a colony to supersede or replace the the mother queen with a new one and I could I, I might I will talk a little bit about that tomorrow and then I moved to to Texas A&M and we have a, a three-year grant from the USDA that is looking at those factors that affect quality in queens and drones specifically the effects of chemicals agrochemicals miticides and uh, other agrochemicals are brought in by the foragers. And so I'll talk about those chemicals, but basically the most pervasive and abundant chemicals are found in the wax in colonies and how those chemicals affect the reproductive health of queens and drones is kind of troubling. Um, and we've now heard a lot of stories about the sublethal effects of chemicals um, on, on, on bee health. So. I'll, we focus a lot of our research on queens and drones, but again, we also do a lot of work with feral honeybees, with nutrition, et cetera. So it's, but mostly my, my passion is reproduction. All right, so, so I'll talk about a, a little bit about what colony fissioning is, which is uh, kind of the technical way to say swarming. And I'll go into those two studies. The first one is the signals that initiate a swarm's departure from the parental nest. Um, then who are those signalers? So what are the bees that are producing those signals? And then uh, if we have time, we'll talk about intercolonial nepotism. This is a little bit more of a dry uh, study, but it's a cool one um, because uh, we can talk about nepotism and whether uh, workers decide to rear their full sister queens or not, uh, based basically on genetic relatedness. And then we'll tell you about what, what we are interested in right now, because this was done, as I said, uh, a couple of years, a few years ago. All right. So 
Reproductive fissioning or colony fissioning is basically another word for swarming in honeybees. And so for those of you who are beginners, first time beekeepers, let's just kind of walk through the basics. Imagine, although most, most honeybees, Apis mellifera anyway, doesn't really um, uh, nest or have open nests. Imagine that this is a kind of a cavity in a tree, but this is just kind of for, um, for picture purposes that you have a colony that is big, has a lot of food, resources, uh, brood, the queen, all the workers, the drones, during the reproductive season, uh, the swarm leaves, right? And so a lot of you have seen those swarms on tree branches. The technical word, do you know what that is? The, the biological word for, uh, maybe not just for honeybees, but for, say, army ants? Bivouac. Very good, bivouac. So. Very good. Festooning? Very festooning is is the behavior on how they hold on to each other, so that they can make these little um, clusters or bivouacs. Very good. So the swarm colony has the majority of the workers and the mother queen. If this is a primary swarm, and we don't have a lot of time to go into after swarming, but basically the first swarm of the year with a mother queen, that's the, the, the um, primary swarm. Sometimes you have after swarms in the same year, so those are headed by um, daughter queens of the original mom. They're usually virgins, and the swarms are smaller, but the first swarm of the year is uh, the primary swarm. It has most of the workers and the mother queen. And then you have the remnant colony has the leftover workers, the, uh, the daughter queen that inherits that colony, uh, all the comb resources and, and the developing brood. Um, almost 20 years ago, uh, Gilly did a study about the age distribution in swarms, because uh, we get asked this question a lot. Um, what is the, is, is it, are swarms comprised of basically a random assortment of workers? Because, you know, workers, we don't really, we can't tell really um, if, if they're young or old uh, based on their appearance. We just kind of have to do um, certain ma uh, manipulations in, if you're doing experiments to tell their age. And so he painstakingly, all of these studies that I'm gonna show you are, took <laughs> years of people's <laughs> lives, like mine when I was a grad student and now my students' lives, are, um, because they're painstaking and, and take a lot of um, um, patience, basically and waiting and waiting and waiting. But so Gilly um, went out and looked at, he was wondering if basically workers of all ages went out and became part of the swarm. But how do you know how old the bees are on a swarm, as I said, because they don't really look, you can't really tell. I mean, the, the young bees are really fuzzy, the baby bees, and then the old, very old bees, you have, they have frail um, wings, you know, they look shiny, kind of worn, uh, but, but you don't know the ones in the middle how old they are. So what he did was he went out to a colony and labeled most of the bees in the colony, and every day he would paint bees with a different color. And so he would know how old those bees were. And so not only that, he would go to a frame of emerging brood. So the baby bees that were just poking out their heads and coming out, and he would put them in an incubator, wait until the next day, because he had brushed off all the bees from those, that frame so that all the bees that would come up in that nuke box the next day, they were all emerged from that day. So they were one day old, he would paint those in a color. The next day he would do the same thing, he would paint those in a different color, put them back in the hive. And so 20, 30 days later, there were 30 different colors of bees, um, and they would be basically of all age compositions. And then he would wait patiently for that colony to swarm. And then he would go catch the swarm. So first, you have to be lucky enough that you have to be there to witness, you know, the swarming, which is what I had to do for my work. So it was basically, you couldn't move out of that place, you know, waiting for the swarm to take off. Capture the swarm and then sort through the swarm, B by B, to look at the color of those bees to look at the age distribution. So do you understand the, the experiment? And then look at the bees that were left behind. 
and see what the age distribution of those bees was to see if basically they were randomly just leaving the nest and becoming part of the swarm. In the, um, so here is the age of the observed bees, five days after emergence, 11, 19, 31, 47, 53. So that's the age of the bees. He did it, look, he did it for um, one, two, three, four swarms and then two after swarms. The um, black bars are the observed numbers. So how many, these are number of bees, how many bees of that age were in the swarm or after swarm compared to the uh, expected values based on the total number of bees in the swarm, kind of did a count and, and did kind of a random assortment. Basically, he noticed that swarms are mostly comp uh, comprised of middle-aged foragers around this age, like 12 to 20, no, actually no, like five to 15 days old. So they're not the nurses. Why would they be the nurses? Why do you think they are not mostly nurses? Or They're back in the hive. They don't really fly, right? They take, they're taking care of the babies. There are no babies in the swarm, right? And they're not the old bees, why not? They're on their way out. So if you have very old bees in the swarm, they're not gonna have enough time to go and start building comb so that the mom can start uh, laying eggs in those new cells in the new location and for the foragers to start putting away food before the winter comes, right? So interestingly, um, they're young enough that upon swarming, they can still produce, be productive and help establish the new nest before dying, um, but they're experienced enough that they've already started their foraging career so they know what the surroundings are, especially when they swarm out, right? So this was one of the first kind of studies on swarming and the composition or, or what's what swarms are uh, made of. Um, there were a couple of studies, in the, one in the 60s and one in the 80s, that did something similar, but not counting bees that were labeled, but counting total number of bees before and after swarming. So how many bees there were in a colony before it, the swarm left, and then how many bees were in the swarm and how many bees were left behind. Needless to say, that's also a very um, time-consuming job and what they found basically was that in those two studies between 68 and 72 percent of the bees left with the with the swarm so when you read and nowadays I think things are changing but when you read in a lot of beekeeping books or in other types of literature it will say that uh, there's a 50 50 split when a swarm leaves and that's not the case in terms of the adult population, right? There are brood left behind. But in terms of the adult population, it's more like three quarters of the population. And then we did it with, with five different colonies, and we also observed the same kind of pattern of exactly 75% of the workers leave with a swarm. So it's three quarters, it's not 50-50. So um, based on those results of those two previous studies and then ours, uh, we wanted to know, with so many bees leaving, with the mother queen, how, how do the workers coordinate this departure, this sudden ephemeral departure from the parental nest without kind of getting lost, uh, without losing track of you know, their, their main uh, goal? And do they decide whether to leave or to stay? And so uh, we'll go into the answers to the second question first, and then if we have time, we'll answer the third one. So inside a colony that's preparing to swarm, there's a lot of things that are going on. So imagine that this box here is the confined space within either a tree cavity or one of your hives, your nukes, your eight frame, your top bar, your 10 frame, whatever equipment you're using. That's, there's only so much space, so much area that can be occupied. Inside of that box or cavity um, uh, is where everything basically happens, right? So you have um, over winter, although probably here you don't have, do you have any break in the brood cycle here in West Palm Beach? No, <laughs> nah. We do have, actually in Texas, we do have a very short um, lived 
breaking the brood cycle. And depending on whether you go to the uh, border with Oklahoma, you can get snow and a break for about two months of, in the brood cycle. But so in the winter, you have that smallest population, probably uh, potentially a, a break in the brood cycle, smallest population in the colony. Um, and then when resources become av available again in the spring, population starts rising again, the queen starts laying eggs again, uh, then there's a, there are new batches of young workers coming out. So you have a, a, a low average age of workers because you have new batches of, of bees. So you have a high population of these young workers. And because you start getting a higher uh, population and a lot of the bees are coming, um, getting all the nectar and pollen, um, the workers run out of room to lay it, to put away food, pollen and nectar to make honey. The queen runs out of space to lay eggs and the workers run out of room to kind of interact with each other. So it's imagine if in this room, instead of 50 people, we had 500, then it would be more difficult to move around and, and kind of start communicating with each other, which is what these social insects do uh, in terms of um, chemicals. Chemical communication is the key in these um, dark, confined spaces. And so when you run out of the room and everyone is crowded, um, this leads to the reduced transmission of the queen pheromones, especially the queen mandibular pheromone. And I'll talk about those more tomorrow. But the queen has a pair of mandibular glands right here. And they produce a blend of dozens of chemicals, that uh, five of which are really important. They, they comprise the queen mandibular pheromone. That pheromone, uh, amongst many things, what it does is it inhibits queen rearing. And that's why typically you will have only one queen in a colony. There are a couple of other exceptions, emergency queen rearing and supersedure, which uh, I'll talk about tomorrow. And the other one is swarming. And so when there's crowding, as in the case of pre-swarming preparation, there's no room for the workers to kind of communicate with each other, passing along those molecules of QMP that tell everyone else, especially the workers in the periphery, that there is a functioning queen. So that kind of leads to the transmission, to the reduction in the transmission of QMP. It loses its power for inhibition of queen rearing, and so they start rearing queens. So those are kind of the physical cues that are going on inside the colony. And so they start constructing cups, which are the precursors for queen cells. The queen herself is the one that lays the eggs in those cups. Nurses start building um, wax around those cups, feeding those um, larvae once they hatch. And then once at least one of the couple dozen sometimes queen cells that are being produced pre-swarming um, is sealed, the, col the colony issues its primary swarm. One, at least one of the cells has to be sealed. Why? Before the swarm can leave. Well, mm, so that it doesn't kill the swarm? Uh, to make sure that like an insurance policy that there will be a queen, at least one that will inherit the colony before, it's, before the primary swarm leaves. Because it's a kind of a, a, once it happens, it's a done deal. They typically never come back to their colony, and so they want to make sure that what's left behind will have a functioning queen, right? So, in preparation for swarming, uh, the workers will limit queen feeding. They basically kind of starve her, start exercising her, and um, the the lack of, of nutrition causes her to reduce her egg laying, um, and so she eventually loses weight. So. Um, there have been a couple of studies that have long-term studies that have looked at the behavior of workers towards a queen months before a swarm leaves. And um, if you only look at her the week before swarming, you might not notice this. But people have, that have looked at the queen for a couple of months before have noticed that um, she starts laying fewer eggs. She gets fewer um, food exchanges from the, the attendants that take care of her. And that's what leads her to losing weight so she can fly. 
Because I did so much work with swarming, I did notice a few failed attempts at swarming where the queen who gets pushed out, she never leads this swarming um, preparation. She kind of is told, let's go, and she like really just gets pushed out of the hive. Sometimes she drops to the floor. She's too fat to fly. And so you can, sometimes you don't see any uh, clustering that's, that sticks basically. Um, and then you wonder why, and then you can see a ball of bees at, on the bottom and they're balling around the queen because she basically can't take off. She's too fat still to... So they exercise her, they shake her, push her, and bite her to keep her moving. That's basically what I need. <laughs> a bunch of attendants that will actually push me to move. And so... And swarming, as I said, is usually time such that a batch of the queen larvae, uh, at least one, but um, is uh, sealed, recently sealed. Th that guarantees that at least one virgin queen will emerge and take care of the, of the um, uh, colony that she inherits. And also prevents competition with the old queen, so uh, she can leave before the other worker, the other larvae, queen larvae emerge. So that's kind of the introduction on what's going on inside a colony in terms of um, cues of what's leading a colony to to swarm. Mm -hmm. In terms of swarming or not? Yes. Uh, no, not. I don't think the workers can. Uh, you will see. It's not as you basically. I kind of gave away the answer of the last question of, of nepotism. They don't make a choice in terms of if they should leave or stay based on anything but age. If they're of the appropriate age, they're more likely to be in the swarm. But they don't really make a choice per se, like in the case of the study that we did, they don't make a choice based on how related they are to the queens that are being reared in the hive. So the bees even if she sends out the same pheromone, feed me? Mm -hmm. Yes, because she's really not the one that's preparing, doing all the, <coughs> sorry, pre-swarming preparations. <coughs> it's more about the, uh, the rest of the things that are going on in the hive, the lack of space and all of that. So they decide it's time to swarm. And they are the ones that manipulate her feeding behavior and to make her um, lose weight. A lot of people think that it's the queen that is pre like leading all of these things, that she is the one that says, it's time for us to get moving because we're swarming. It's the other way around. She is one of the last ones to leave the hive, and she, they, they make her leave. <coughs> In terms of what? In terms of swarming, it may be not a strong hive, but they will swarm. Yeah, that's true. And it's also about races. So there are races that are more swarmy than others. But if they swarm, this is what's going on. It's not the workers that make the, de it's not the queen that makes the decision it's time to leave. It's the, the workers based on the conditions inside the hive. And as you said, it's not a perfect science. Sometimes there are um, failed attempts and colonies that you think they should not have swarmed, but they did. And that swarm will probably not make it. No one has looked at that. Okay. And you will see that in my future, future research. <laughs> That's one of my line items. No one has really looked at what's going on with the, sw the, with the drones. Who's not, um, who's not lazy, fly. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I have a um, quiz question. I just mentioned that um, that first swarm leaves with the mom. At least in temperate regions where there is a true winter and there's a break in the brood cycle and there's this need to start um, building comb really quick for a swarm and then um, laying eggs for the queen and, and the work and the foragers putting away food because winter's coming. Um, in those situations, what do you think is the success rate of a swarm to make it to the next year? I heard 25. I heard two? Five? five. Yeah. 20. 
Dr. Seeley made that calculation. So only 20% of one-year-old colonies, or I guess first-year swarms, make it to the next year. The rest die. They don't make it. The American Free Journal says only 2% of the swarms in the nation reach the first birthday. I don't. Maybe it's two zero because that's from the Dr. Seeley's book. So I don't know if that was a time. In, in Dr. Seeley's area, right? Right. Forest yes. Uh, in the Arnott Forest, yes. So we don't know what that number is in places where there are no um, uh, brood cycle breaks, probably higher. Yeah. And then. Down here is higher, yes, exactly. And I'm talking about feral colonies, but. You would also think of this is also why in, in regular beekeeping there's no there has to be some uh, losses as well over over winter. How about uh, pre-established colonies? So if they make it for one year, then what's their chances? What, what are their chances of making it the following year? Like two plus years. Eighty. Eighty percent. So once you're established, you have a good chance of making it, perpetuating for a few years. Depending population size? Population size, they already have a nicely built um, cavity. Uh, if it withstood the first winter, it's because they have the right genetics probably to make it through that first tough year, and, and so they're, they're better off for the following years. But they, they every year. That, yes, but the parental colony from, from that uh, hive, the, the, the location. After that first year, now the, that hive particularly will or will not swarm. It can. They replace the queen? No, it, it, all of those things can happen if they replace the queen or, but each right. colony, each, each body of bees with a queen, again, Dr. Seeley did the study, it's about 1.3 swarms per year per colony. So it's actually more than one. They get, a lot of colonies do issue after swarms. They be, get big enough to have enough resources so that they can issue another swarm that same year. If the queen in, in, in the swarm leaves the hive and then dies, like mm -hmm. so now there'll be a new queen in the, in the hive, but that queen is, is a virgin queen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't come back. Don't come back. Mm -hmm. So then you have a colony left behind. That's, that daughter queen uh, eventually mates. She starts laying. And potentially, there could be another after swarm with even one of her mom's uh, youngest daughters that maybe was only you know in the egg stage when she, the mom le left. So many things. On, I'm telling, um, uh, we don't know much about after swarms, actually. But I just wanted to ask that question if you knew, you know, the, the, but, so even though it's so low, you know, 20% chance of making it, it's better than nothing, right? Because this is the idea of, of reproduction is so that you can, the genes can be passed on um, over time. And so it's better than, than doing no swarming because then there's no really fitness um, units being earned. So when you think about um, a swarm that leaves the parental nest, you can uh, see it in the context of animals that live in groups moving together to a new location, right? <clears throat> so how do animal groups initiate and coordinate travel? And there's three major ways in which group, so groups of animals move to a new location. There's three mechanisms of decision making. Um, the first one is democratic. We're very familiar with democratic decision making. This is where the majority of a group makes the decision, right? Like right now, if we're, you know, if, if I'm taking too long giving this talk and we are get hungry, then maybe most of you would say, yeah, let's go eat dinner because we're getting hungry. So the majority of the group, this is seen in the whooper swans or in the red deer. Um, in the whooper swans, when they're ready to move, they all have to bob their heads. At least 60% of them have to bob their, their heads in unison before the group moves. If a couple of them started and then it doesn't catch, you know, the wave doesn't catch, then it's, 
it, then they have to restart the process because only when 60% reaches it that they can um, take off. The same in the red deer, they have to have more than 50% of them moving their heads in the direction of where they're going to move, to move together as a group. And if that threshold number does, doesn't get re is not reached, they can't move. The other one is, so this is the majority. This is the opposite. This is despotic mechanism of decision making, um, more like a totalitarian kind of dictatorship where one leader makes the choice for the whole group. Um, this is seen in the Hamadryas baboons and in the African elephant. They're both species where um, there's one leader that makes the decision. In the, in the elephant case, the female is a leader and she stomps her foot or yeah, one of their legs and she tells them it's time to go by this stomping of the one foot and then everyone follows her, she's the leader. And there's this intermediate um, mechanism uh, called oligarchic decision making in which an oligarchy, basically a small minority, makes the decision on behalf of the group. So it's not one, it's not the majority, it's a small group of well-informed individuals that makes the decision. This is seen in the rock ants and actually a lot of social insects that do some swarming and raiding and, and movement in groups. And as Dr. Seeley showed, in swarms, right? Bivouacked swarms, when they are here in the tree branch or wherever they are, it's a small group of workers that makes the decision of where and when to move to that new home that they will call, you know, the tree cavity or where they're going to live. So the question is, what are those signals that initiate a honeybee swarm's departure from the parental nest, and what, which one of these three mechanisms are they using to make that choice? So this was done, actually, now 10 years ago. Oh my gosh. Um, <clears throat> uh, when I was a student at Cornell University, and basically this shed was my home for a couple of years. Um, it had several windows and so I set up observation colonies in each one of those windows that had an exit to you know to the outdoors but to keep them as close to natural conditions as possible I kept them in the dark with with uh, lids and only one of the sides would be open if it was being used for uh, video recording how many of you have not seen an observation hive before Okay, a few of you. So this is kind of one of the pictures. It's glass walled, so you can see through either both sides of the of the frames. This one, in this case, had three frames. Sometimes there, I've seen some for for research that have eight frames. Some that people take to school fairs or the, the state fair that only have one frame. And so three frames, and then I put in a microphone before I closed it up. This is a cable right here and a microphone right here. And to allow this process to take place as natural as possible, um, I turned off the light and I just turned on the video camera and video recorded what was going on inside that colony in the dark using um, the night vision capability of the video camera. In a small area here at the bottom of the... Uh, uh, in the center of the bottom frame, because it's the one that had the most activity, the entrance was here, and most of the dancing, the waggle dancing, was happening on the bottom frame. Typically, that's the case in most observation colonies. So most of the the, the analysis basically took place after the colony left. Um, this is also the type of study, the setup that I had. You see the grid with the boxes. This is what I did to count the number of bees in each one of those boxes when I was doing the three quarters of the population uh, leaving versus staying. Um, so I would count the number of bees every day and then wait for the colony to, to issue the swarm and then I would count the number left behind and then that's how I calculated the proportion that left. Anyway, so that's the setup for, the, for these types of studies with the microphone. Because I didn't know when a colony was swarming and I was allowing for natural swarming to take place, um, I just turned on the video camera basically from 10 a.m. in the morning, 10 a.m., sorry, 10 a.m. to about 3 p.m. And I would just recycle the tapes until something happened. Oh, fed them, yes. Yeah. So kept, kept, kept a feeder in case there was no natural forage there, yeah. 
Because that's a good point. Do you know that bees, before they swarm, they uh, eat, right? They fill, fill up because they don't know when they're going to have their next meal. Not only that, but also because being fully satiated changes their physiology so that they can produce wax scales, which is what they need to build the comb for the new home. Good question. So I had a couple of, of, of predictions of what signals were being used based on what Dr. Seeley had already found on the bivouac. One of them was maybe they're using the piping signal. So the, in this signal, the worker that's producing the, the piping signal presses her thorax against another bee uh, for a few seconds. And the message on the bivouac, on you know, Dr. Seeley's work on those tree branches, the message is it's time to warm up. And they start this, so the bees that produce this signal produce it for a couple of hours and the temperature of the swarm raises by, by f f several degrees in temperature. So this is what um, the piping signal looks and sounds like. In this case, there's a caged queen right here. And this worker is uh, piping, well, anyone that will listen. <laughs> but in this case, there's no more bees left except the queen because she's caged, she can't leave. But she would if she could, but she just... And that's a microphone right here. So how do we know the, this is the queen? They don't know the, that she's no, the queen. The queen no, the worker. Worker piping. You will see her piping. Uh, queen piping is different and they, it sounds different. Oops. So she's pressing her thorax and piping the, trying to pipe that B. Right there. So time to go. The next signal that Dr. Seeley had found on swarms is the very, it's the, the more, I think, elaborate signal, it's called the buzz run signal. It almost looks like, um, like the, the bee wants to take off flying, but she doesn't. She kind of hovers over the bees and she kind of, I, I don't know, yeah, it's just hovering and then, but she never really does take off. And she opens her wings wide open and bumps into as many bees as possible at random. The message on the bivouacs is it's time to go. Once the bees have been primed with the piping signal and they're warm enough on the swarm, then the buzz run pr is produced and it tells them, okay, now we're warm enough, now it's time to break the cluster and start moving to the new home. And so you'll see a few of these bees producing the buzz run signal. This bee. And she's just going crazy, trying to get as many of them. That's the buzz run. It's like a fly that, that she found honey and giving them the signal, no? Um, they, they have some similarities, but the buzz run signal is only produced in this context. And the other one we wanted to see is the shaking signal because the shaking signal has been found to increase kind of inactivity in the hours and hours and days prior to swarming. Have you seen the shaking signal? Do you know which one? It, they also call it the DVAV, dorsal abdominal vibration alarm. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the shaker kind of takes the other bee and it just goes, hey, and, and does it also with her with her butt like this. And it's a very, um, it's, you can see a lot of, maybe from now on you'll pay attention to the, shake, the shaking signal. It's very interesting. Almost every morning, it's kind of the, the activation signal that will tell other bees, go and find food. It's time to go get food. It's not communicating where the food is, like the waggle dance does, or the round dance. It's just telling them, get active. And so we wanted to see if that signal changed in production uh, prior to swarming. And that one's one that you can see very often, almost 
at all times you'll find bees uh, doing the shaking signal. And then we wanted to see if there was a change in the production of the waggle dance in the, in the hours prior to swarming. You know, how the waggle dance communicates uh, the location of food, right? It's, it, it's at this distance away from here, at this direction. It's an A-shaped motion. So I don't need to show, hopefully, I don't need to show a video of it. But And so we wanted to see what aspects of mobility or activity level changed w during departure. We looked at density, as in the number of bees that were present uh, at any given time, kind of because we, we knew the density was going to drop as bees exited the hive. But we wanted to see if the, there was any um, relation between the drop in density and the activity level of, those of some of those signals and mobility aspects. Um, I painstakingly <laughs> took a line Remember, all of this was in the video on the video camera, so I had to do hours and hours of video analysis because it was every 30 seconds I would have to look for hours of, of video recording. I would take a little line, count the number of bees that crossed that line in in uh, 30 seconds um, to see kind of basically mobility. Then we did something called the mobility index, which is basically um, the same mobility compensating for the drop in density. And this one was fun too, the average velocity. I took an acetate sheet with 10 randomly placed uh, dots with, dot made with a Sharpie on top of uh, uh, um, the, um, the video um, screen when I'm watching, and then looked for the closest B to each one of those dots and followed that B for three seconds and followed her path and then I used one of those um, um, little gadgets that they sell where you, that measures like maps. You know how you can take a map, a topography map, and then it kind of goes around and it tells you how long in the distance um, that really the scale is. I used that to uh, get s um, millimeters per second travel. I, this, is, this became really difficult during the, the prime moment of exodus because the bees were moving so fast. So I had to do it every frame, and there's 30 frames per second in a regular video camera. How did you come up with three seconds? Oh, because uh, five would have been, <laughs> I mean, twice as much work. It was enough so that you can tell a change in the, in the uh, yeah, speed. But 30 per frame. 30 per frame, yeah. And then the signals, the piping rate. How many seconds out of 30 seconds could you hear piping? Uh, and then we scan sampled the video recording from left to right and top to bottom uh, for the production of the buzz run signal, the waggle dance, and the shaking signal. Okay? So that's, those are the, how we did it. This is one of those videos. Would you mind turning off the light? If, I don't know where the light might be. So this colony took 120 minutes, yes, from the moment that I started the video recording. Of course, the preparations happened days before, but from the moment that I started the video recording. So you'll start paying attention to the piping signal. Um, so when you hear that piping, those are the bees near the microphone. You don't know who's producing those signals, but you can hear the piping. And then you start seeing higher activity. And then the buzz run, hopefully, and I'll show it. And then the, the colony leaves. So this is the microphone here. This is 20 minutes into this. I mean, I don't know if you can tell, but I start seeing a little bit more activity and you start hearing the do you hear the piping? These don't care. They're just eating the, the tape. Higher activity, right? Do you see them a little more agitated? And then continuous piping. And now, boom. They start leaving. All of these bees that are moving really fast are producing the buzz run signal. These ones. These ones here. 
this one. Especially when they bump into here, you can see them. this one right here, this one, this one. And then that's it. They're gone. Everyone that was going to leave left, these are the ones left behind. And like nothing happened, these ones never noticed what happened. They just kept chewing. And that's it. So about that quarter of the workers stayed behind. Um, and that's what happens inside one of those colonies. When, when you see those swarms on the branches, that's what's happening in those colonies before they leave. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but what time of day was that? Like, uh, this one. If you don't remember, it's not that I think this one left at around one or two. Okay. Typically, that's a time where they like to leave. Well, if they're leaving at one or two, that means the foragers supposedly that went out early in the morning, mm -hmm. did they go out? Or did they yes. stay behind knowing something was going no. on? No. They go, and that's a good point, and we'll show you something. So. Um, here, you know, I showed, actually I showed 160 minutes, not 120. Um, so time zero here is when, when I started the video recording. And here are the things that I said, aspects of mobility. That gray box is the 18 minutes that it took for the bees to leave. So I would also look on the outside and I knew that the bees were leaving and I started recording when that happened. And it took about 18 minutes for this particular swarm to leave. And uh, as you, I mean, not surprisingly, the density dropped, right? Because the bees were leaving. But what's interesting is that it dropped here. And then as soon as they left, the foragers that were outside trying to come back went in. Because when they're leaving, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it's just, it's like an avalanche of bees going out. So the ones are, yeah, and they, yeah, exactly. So the velocity kind of uh, went up in almost um, 40, 40 times higher when the, the exodus happened. The same for the mobility. So they were just moving more agitatedly and, and then they dropped to below, pro, below swarming levels. So you can see that the activity is higher prior to swarming, it just speak, you know, it, it speeds up and then they drop down to basically the more normal. And I bet that if I had done it longer, it would have probably dropped more in um, activity level. And as, in terms of the signals, um, I started hearing piping, as you also probably hopefully heard a little bit, you know, like 20 minutes into the recording and there was more piping produced and then it went up to uh, 30, which is out of the 30 seconds, I heard piping for those 30 seconds in the peak of departure and then it dropped to zero. The buzz run rate, it only started really being produced at the beginning of the of the departure and then it went up by 50 times its original number and then it dropped to zero. Not, but I didn't see any changes in the shaking signal or the wag, waggle dance uh, production. And I did this for um, several, of, uh, several um, swarms. I didn't do it with just one because I wanted to see if this, you know, the repeatable, you know, in science you have to do several <laughs> to show that is. Um, and I also wanted to see what proportion of the bees was producing the buzz run signal? Because it was clearly, as you saw, the, the bees that were moving really fast. I, you have to take my word for, for the fact that it was the bees, that, that those fast bees that I showed you had their wings open, producing the buzz run signal because I did 30 frames per second. But if you do it at regular speed, you can't see that because they're moving their wings so fast. But you have to kind of take me for, for what I, or believe what I just said. So I looked for the total number of bees seen on the video screen and then looked for the proportion of those bees that was producing the buzz run. So this is the number of bees on the video screen, about uh, 200 um, for that screenshot. And then the number that was producing the buzz run signal, not surprisingly, I don't know if you can see this box, this gray box, this is the duration of the swarm departure for two different swarms. And um, at first, you only had a couple of bees producing it, but then the total proportion of bees that started, that produced here, the buzz run went up to about 20%, and it was the same for the second um, swarm. And this, and, and this is the density dropping over time. So basically, this tells me, or tell, told us, that um, at first, you have a very small number of bees producing the buzz run signal. 
but then it, it's almost like it's a chain effect and then others kind of get con the uh, um, kind of the, the buzz run, yeah, trigger, and they start producing it more. And that's probably why you see a mass exodus here, because there are more bees producing that signal that says it's time to go. So in conclusion, the max exodus of a, parent, uh, of, a, of a swarm from the parental colony is explosive, and it takes only between 10 to 18 minutes. Um, the piping signal is observed more than an hour before the swarm leaves, so it is the key signal to follow. Um, during that peak time, there are dramatic increases in the mobility, the velocity, the production of the buzz run signal and the piping signal, but not in the production of the waggle downs or the shaking signal. Um, the behavioral patterns are consistent across different swarms because I, I couldn't, didn't have time to show you, but I did it across several swarms. And less than 1% of the workers started producing the triggering signal, especially the buzz run signal. Therefore, what kind of mechanism are they using? for this. Which one? Oligarchic. Oligarchic, yes. <laughs> yes. So I'm curious, if you have this nifty little microphone there and you're looking for signals and you wanted to interrupt this before it happens, like an hour before it happens, did you try that? We haven't tried it. Um, if you, some people try to plug the entrance. <laughs> uh, they will cause a bottleneck and they will suff suffocate. Once they are on that, in that mode, it's too late. A lot of people have asked me this question. There are companies and people that are kind of inventors that have created those gadgets already. I, it, I, I was actually surprised once I, we published all of this, there were a few people in Italy and a lot in Europe that were really interested in making um, frequency detectors that could detect these uh, piping signals. Potentially, I would say that it would work more if they start catching the piping signal maybe days prior to swarming, but not the day off. I think the day off, if you're lucky, I mean, you saw how long it takes, not very long. So you have to be at the right place at the right time. For swarm prevention, Exactly. If only if you're there, right? That's oh, only the, exactly. But put put the swarm in another box. Yeah, exactly. Is there, is there any other time that you hear piping in a hive? Not for this. There's um, queen piping. There's the stop signal. But this type of piping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The frequency is, well, it's not as repetitive as this one. This one, you can tell that it goes up in frequency right before it swarms. Sometimes you hear a little bit of piping has slightly different frequency and it's for other purposes. If you only hear it, um, you know, sporadically, um, it's for something else. With all that extra activity, does the temperature go up? Yes, it does. A lot? Yes, it goes up by... Um, well, we did it in degrees Celsius. It went up by more than five degrees. But um, that wasn't published. That's one of those graphs that I spent a lot of time on, and we didn't put it in this paper. Huh? Yeah, well, I'll show you. Oh, it was done in the next one. So now we knew what these signals were. Who are the bees that are producing those signals? Because here we just had that, that omnidirectional microphone, so no idea who those bees were. To answer that question, we had to actually look at the hive um, in a way that we could follow an individual bee. Not only did we want to answer that question of what's, who are those bees that are producing the signals, but the important question was, do they start looking for their homes before they leave? Because I don't know if you have read Honeybee Democracy, but on the swarms in the bivouac, these bees that do, are doing the house hunting process, they're doing kind of a quorum reaching process of, I found this one and, and another bee found another one and there's kind of competition between those sites and depending on the quality of the sites, one typically gets more followers and, and typically that's the one that they choose to go to. Not always, it's not a perfect system, but about 80% of the time they choose the, the one that has the best quality. And they do a lot of, it takes uh, anywhere from a few hours to a few days for a swarm to, that is on a tree branch to leave for their new home, doing that house hunting process. But I wanted to ask, 
I don't know if you've ever wondered, do they look for homes before they even leave their colony, yes, their nest? And if so, is there a recruitment to those sites? I've actually uh, was called out to the swarm on the side of a house about two and a half stories up. It was difficult for me to get that, go get along the ladder. By the time I went and got the ladder, came back, I was going up the ladder, and it left. <laughs> okay. And it kept on going. And then, uh, okay, well, it's gone. So I loaded up my ladder and left. And about 4 o'clock that afternoon, they called me back, and the swarm had come back. <laughs> because for, for whatever reason, where they were going, and decided they didn't like it, maybe, and wanted to start over. They, lost, they, lost the queen. they may have lost a queen, but also, I don't have to tell you that. They compete between swarms for homes. Yeah. Yes, yes, and I will show you, so I'll show you, I'll show you some, some stuff. I don't have time to show the cool videos, but. Um, will bees that are living in a soffit of a house move into another soffit of a house before they would choose another location? So if they're living in a tree, will they go to a tree? If they're living in a water meter, will they go to a water meter? If they're living in a... I don't think so, no. Uh, but if they're Africanized, they're less picky. <laughs> because um, if I go into a community and there's a builder flaw, <laughs> bees are always in that same flaw mm. in, in all the houses. In all the houses. <laughs> That's very interesting. I don't know. Um, so I was thinking that, hey, this is where we go and we call home, and there's one that looks just like it over here. Why don't we call that one home? Well, in their natural history, they're in trees, so not in... in, in the people that build this section of the community made the same mistake. Every yeah, every place. Yeah, every time. So anyway, let's, let's, go cause, um, let's go on, because I don't think I'll have enough time to talk about the third one, but this one's cool. So this was done on Appledore Island off the coast of Maine, and this is where Dr. Seeley does all of his work. Uh, it's about... I think it's about 15 miles off the coast of New, between New Hampshire and Maine. So it's right here, New Hampshire and Maine, New Hampshire, Maine, and the Isles of Shoals. <laughs> and that's where the um, uh, Shoals Marine Laboratory is, and Cornell own, owns um, the uh, part of the biological station there, right here. And so there's really not much except a few buildings for research only. And the cool thing about this island is um, there's no bees, no honeybees. There's no trees. It's all just poison ivy, basically, and shrubs. And really, really nasty, mean, um, oh, it's these white birds. Seagulls. Oh, my gosh. When they're nesting, oh, they're, they're evil. People have to walk either with a stick like this, or some of the students that did their work with marine, in marine biology would devise helmets with prongs so that they wouldn't because they they attacked my my assistant and and he was bleeding because they're so vicious when they're nesting they're so protective anyway so we uh set up observation colonies in one of the buildings and then we put up nest boxes so that these swarms would go the undergo the um uh house hunting process because there's no homes for bees on that island no trees so maybe some um, buildings would have these crevices and maybe they would go for those, but other than that, there was no, no place to go home and of course no bees. So what we would have to do is get on a ship with nukes, closed up nukes, and take our nukes to the island and you know suddenly people started seeing honeybees on the island. That was very weird because there were no bees the day before and suddenly there's a bunch of bees. And then when we were done with the experiments, we just seal them up at night and then get on the, on the boat again and then take them to land and then drive to Ithaca for like seven hours with five colonies of bees in the car. <laughs> anyway, that was fun. Um, so we set up observation colonies like this, like the ones in the other experiment, but this time we had them open uh, kind of w with the lights on so we could see what was going on. And, you know, the mi microphone is here. And... Is it funny? 
And for it. I'm sorry, but I, I have to. Let me tell you a little story. I, have to <laughs> I, I, I had this old car, and I was moving some bees, and I just set them on the hood of the car. And a, and a, a, a cop friend of mine had the road blocked up there, you know. And I drove over up to him and said, "What's going on here, Bernie?" And he said, "Get the hell out of here!" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what happened to a guy. Um, he he's Egyptian, so in, he lives in Canada. He's one of the apiary inspectors in Canada. So when he travels to the U.S., sometimes he gets a little bit harassed. And so one time he, he, the same guard just didn't like him. So one time he just said, there's a hive of bees in the back truck. You're welcome to, you know, search. And that was the last time that, that happened. So anyway, so we have the microphone here. And for your question in the back, we had a thermometer that would read temperature every minute. And we had a thermometer probe inside the hive and one outside that would measure outside temperature. So that was really cool because we, know, we were able to show that, you know, during the day temperature went up naturally because it got warmer during the day as the day progressed. But inside it was dramatically higher by like six degrees during the swarm's departure. So they get primed with that piping signal to warm up the temperature. So we wanted to follow individual bees and to our surprise and also luck, we noticed that because it was so warm, the bees created a beard, just like they do probably here very often when they're very big. The beard is a way, uh, one of the thermoregulatory mechanisms so that the, the bulk of bees, their older bees, can be outside and therefore there's fewer bees inside and temperature goes a little bit down or at least it's not as warm. Airflow. Huh, airflow too, yeah. And so they, they formed a beard as well. And it was the only way we could have done this study because we noticed that most of the activity in swarming preparation happened on the beard outside. So one of the cool things that you can look at is in your colonies when you see beards and they're going to swarm, most of the preparation is happening there first. So we had... They go inside? They will also go inside, you'll see. But most of the activity starts here on the, on the beard outside because it's older bees that are producing these as you will see and so they are typically foragers and forager age so we had these those observation colonies then we had this neck the nest box you know who that is dr seeley so we went together we did this he was my assistant which was cool <laughs> um so we set up a, a, a few nest boxes. He, because he did all the work of house hunting, he has a lot of nest boxes that are the appropriate size and he keeps them there on the island. So we set up the shed with the box inside. It has a little hole here. Um, and so we waited for nest site scouts to visit. First, we lured the box so that they can smell, you know, some, some wax and a little bit of um, Nasanov scent. And then once they find it, we take out the lure, and they've already kind of keyed in, um, keyed in on, on the site. We labeled all the visiting bees with a paint on their thorax and communicated so our assistant would be here at the nest box and, and someone would be at the observation colony who would say, okay, I just labeled five bees with white. And so the person would be at the observation colony because we had three going on at the same time. We wanted them to issue a swarm naturally whenever they wanted to. And so um, they would say, you would say, oh, yeah, I see a white bee on this one. So we knew maybe this one was already kind of house hunting. And, and, and then we continued labeled bees until the colony swarmed. Um, but again, we didn't know which colony we were going to do it, so we kept um, an eye on all three of them at, at, at all times. We started this every day, like at 6.30 in the morning until like 5 in the afternoon for at least two weeks, so... A lot of work. Anyway, so what did we measure? At the beard, because we noticed that most of the activity started at the beard, every 15 minutes we scanned sample like this visually. Uh, the number of bees that were running faster than the rest of the bees that were performing the waggle dance, the piping signal, and the buzz run signal. And we noticed whether those bees that were producing the signals were labeled or not, because we kept labeling bees at the, at the um, nest site. And then at the nest box, Every 15 minutes, we counted or estimated the total number of bees that were 
uh, around at any given time. So in a snapshot moment, we would kind of look like, I think there's kind of a patch of maybe 10, 20 bees. It wasn't precise science. Um, the total number of bees that, were that we kept painting. So this was going on simultaneously? At the same time. And the number observed outside of the nest box, like right at the entrance. Again, whether they were labeled or not, or if we couldn't tell if there was a paint dot on them, we knew that too. When we started the process of painting, because we would keep them here, and the, they would go in, basically, and do the house hunting. And if you've read Dr. Seeley's book or have seen him speak, you will see that these bees will go in and start, basically, it's like... Uh, like um, real estate purchasing. They start looking, they go from one corner to the other, measuring size, looking for crevices, leaks, kind of regular size, an idea of size. And they don't do that in one trip. They go many times to back to the same site. And on each site, they get more adventurous and they go further away from one corner to the next. And, and, and they start doing like a three-dimensional trip of the box that's what they were doing but so as soon as they got out we would catch them with a net and put a dot at first you know we had beautiful round dots on the thorax you know they was like a hard shape or so at the end we just couldn't keep up because there were so many bees that we just like you know just put paint anywhere that that, that we could um put paint on you know like wings i mean probably we lost a few of those because um, we it got really sloppy because we didn't have enough manpower. If we had known that this was going to be like this, we probably could have used basically two more people for this study. Um, so we missed, the, the key point is we missed a lot of bees. We missed painting a lot of bees because we didn't have the manpower for that, and that's important coming up. So there's a lot of information on this on this. Um, on this slide, but I'm going to walk you through it. For this one, again, 1250 was the time that it, the swarm left. So these are the results at the nest box on this side and then at the hive on that side. At the nest box, so in the box at the, that Dr. Seely was at or I was at, or we had here the, tom, the total, this is the time of day for that particular day, the number of bees labeled every 15 minutes. We started with a few number of bees and then the number kept going up and up every 15 minutes. Here is the total number of bees that were by the nest box. And again, that number went up. And then number of bees that were labeled at the, at, at the nest box. At first, most of them were labeled in the black bars. In white, they're the ones that are unlabeled. And as time progressed and we got sloppier and sloppier, we had more <laughs> bees that we couldn't catch uh, to get a paint dot on them, but they should be labeled. Maybe these got labeled later, we don't know. Maybe these got labeled here, we don't know. But as you can see, we got, we missed some of them in terms of labeling them. At the hive, here's the total number of bees that were performing the waggle dance. I should say, because we know how to read the waggle dance, we knew if they were dancing for the nest site or for another location. For example, um, during this particular one, we started reading a waggle dance for a location that was on the other side of the island. Um, and it was longer duration, different angle, if you know how the waggle dance works. And so we wanted to see what place they were competing, we were competing against. And we went up and it was the firehouse and there was a rolled up rug and they were going inside the roll of uh, the rolled up rug. And that was the location they were going for. There are so few places that they were going for very... Um, How did Dr. Seeley handle that? Because usually he says he has to be 50 feet in the air and a half a mile apart. We just <laughs> opened the rug and we got rid of the problem. We just unrolled the rug. But so that's... that. So I should say, if we started seeing on that beard bees that were performing the waggle dance for a different location, we, would, we wouldn't kill them. We would put them in a jar with honey until this process was done because we didn't want the competition. Yeah, in this place, we were not doing the house hunting competition per se. We just wanted to see if they were producing the waggle dance for our location, which would indicate that they're recruiting to our location. 
And um, the waggle dance, again, increased dramatically uh, in the hours prior to the takeoff. Um, the number of bees running, which are the bees that later on produce the piping signal and the buzz run signal. And look at the number of bees producing the piping signal. And they're all labeled, except for very few here at the end. And I suspect that these are not labeled because we didn't get enough painters, enough people painting bees, but the majority were, were labeled. Furthermore, we did this for three days for this particular one, which meant that we were labeling bees and they were recruiting bees for at least three days prior to the swarm leaving. So that answered the question, yes, they are recruiting. To the, they are looking for homes before the swarm leaves and they're recruiting to that site. For this particular one, we labeled almost 500 bees in five days for a, an observation colony of about 7,000 bees. That's almost 10% of the workers were recruited to this site. But what's interesting is that back at the, of the observation colony in, in, the neck, in those three days, we did not see 500 painted bees. We did not know what happened to them. They're, I mean, it's, they're not dancing for the rug anymore, or they're, I mean, I, I doubt that there's, you know, suddenly all these birds eating 500 bees, you know, in, in something is happening to these bees and we can't see them. We don't see them on the beard. We don't see them inside the observation colony. What's happening? So when we finished the experiment, in this case, because there's poison ivy on the island everywhere, uh, we prevented the swarm from leaving in that when they started leaving, like the, like the exodus that I showed you earlier, we did kind of plug it, but so we allowed them to basically go in to a box. We put them into the nuke box. Um, and w we caught the queen before she left, because if she left, then that was it. We were going to lose the swarm, and we actually did have to hunt a couple of these in the middle of the poison ivy grounds, and that was not fun. Um, so we weren't, we knew how the swarming occurred. Our questions were different this time. But so we were done. We would dismantle that colony, put it back to its nucle uh, nucleus colony, and then we would work with the other ones. So we would go to the nest box. And we opened the nest box. Most of these bees were in there. Guarding the box. They were guarding the box. How do we know they were guarding the box? The next year we went and answered the question and we put competing swarms, um, house hunting for the same one nest box and we caught amazing video of them killing each other inside that box. So there's competition for these very high quality boxes. Because if you have if you've seen swarms, like especially after bad weather days, you'll see many swarms take off at the same time on the same day. That happened to me many times. It's because they get the same cues, the same ideal temperature and, and weather conditions. And so, and the same quality um, kind of, um, Good quality sites are good quality sites for all bees. And so they would all go for the very good quality site and they compete for each other. Did you notice that when they were in the guarding phase of the new home, were they more feisty with you guys too? No. Yeah. Not with us, but we weren't. They were more like inside because there were no other bees competing really. Um, maybe tomorrow if you have time before or after, I'll show you the videos because we have those videos. <laughs> No, yeah, it can I've happen. Seen I've, I've seen that several times. Like, yeah. Where they're hovering around the box, and I go, hmm, and they start to come out. Yeah, know? well, in our case, they, I mean, and they're very mild mannered European bees. So it could probably be different if they were more uh, feisty. So nest site scouts are the ones that initiate the swarm departure because they're the ones that um, are the ones that produce the piping signal and then produce the buzz run signal. 
um, the first ones anyway that produce the buzz run signal. And most of the activity starts on the um, on the beard. What I failed to mention is that then they move inside the observation colony inside, and then they start doing the same thing, the signaling, for the other ones to leave. <laughs> yep, exactly. So the first thing that happens is the, the beard leaves. The beard takes off, and then the rest from the inside goes. And the cool thing is the search starts before the swarm leaves. So days prior to your swarms being on the bivouac, they will have started the house hunting process. Why, don't they, why do they use bivouacs? Everyone asks. If they're already starting, why don't they just go, go directly to their place? And it's because the situation changes on a daily basis in terms of availability. And so they, they can't really be sure that that site is available on the time that they leave. That's our guess. Now, there, you know that swarms take different time amounts of time on the bivouac. Sometimes they take a few hours, sometimes they take a few days. Maybe the duration has to do with whether they've, I mean, it has to do with how, with the consensus building but also maybe because if they went underwent like really thorough house hunting before the swarm left, maybe they don't have to do a lot of decision making on the swarm uh, on the bivouac. Who knows? I found that a virgin after swarm will hang out in bivouac a lot longer, and I wonder if they're waiting for her to mate before they decide to move into a home. I don't yes. think. I don't know. I don't know any, I, we don't know much in terms of like scientific studies with quantitative data, there's very little on after swarms because they're so ephemeral and so difficult to catch. Usually after like, you know, 72 hours, they, they usually stay where they, you know, they don't, they don't take off. I've had for a week, two virgin after swarms, 130 feet high here, 130 feet high here. I can't get to them, they're too high. Yeah, and sometimes you will see that they will stay and they will hang out there. And maybe around here that's not as, as uh, uh, detrimental because you don't have a true winter. But they can't really do that in the in temperate regions because then the cold snap will just basically chill them and kill them. So th there's a lot of variability depending on the latitude and the... Um, the races and whether they're Africanized, of course. Um. The search for, for a new home starts in, before a swarm. That means it, it starts, it takes a lot longer to search the home than the actual time that the swarm starts. Yeah, outside. yeah. But again, we, because we haven't really followed up on this yet, we don't know if all colonies do this, but all the ones that we studied did it. We don't know how many days before, on average. Um, if it changes with the size of the colony, we, we, there's a lot of questions we don't know yet. The uh, first sentence for nest scouts initiate, did you look at the age of those scouts? No. Are they always older? I would yes, say they're always experience. older. Yes, they're older always scouts. experienced older bees. And Dr. Teeley has done the study on their age. They're older foragers that are very... Uh, knowledgeable on the landmarks around. And the cool thing is that they do recruit. So they do produce the waggle dance and a lot of it uh, when they find a good spot. And so they start recruiting bees to look at their, their sites that they found. Potentially those are probably also the sites that they continue deliberating for um, once the bivouac is on the Yes, some, but um, but very few of them. Very few. Do you know if they bring scent from the original hive to the new place, so this will help them to go to the... Um, we, because of the... We, I don't know the answer to your question, but because of all the work that Tom has done, um, we already knew that they like hives that already have been habit, inhabited by other bees, so we did put pieces of comb, and those boxes have been used for many years. So if it smells like bees, they will more likely stay there than, than leave. Would they ever attract bees from another colony to become part of that new No. Colony? 
Mm -mm. No, because there's a uh, kin recognition. So they, they have their own colony smell that is based tr mostly on their mom's smell. And so they will know nest mates from non nest mates. I, again, I don't have time for this study basically, but, um, but uh, we basically did the study of whether, I told you that many queens are produced prior to swarming. But you know that m m queens mate multiply, right? And you, the average is about 12 to 14 drones that they mate with. So that means that there's 12 or 14 subfamilies in the colony. So it, if we all have different fathers in this room, then, but some of us are full sisters because we have the same father and we're half sisters to the rest because they, they have different fathers. The relatedness between us, full sisters, and me and them, the half-sisters, is much different. And so we wanted to see whether if the queens that are being reared are my full sisters, would I be more likely to stay and take care of my full sisters' babies as the new queen or half-sisters' babies? They're much less related to me than my full sisters' babies. That was our question, kind of very deep in the... Um, evolution. No, the answer is no. Mm -mm. So, uh, yeah. For that, we also had to take swarm bees once the swarm left, uh, remnant uh, um, hive bees, and all the developing queens inside. And we had to do genetics, basically. We're able to determine with a genetic test whether we belong to this subfamily or this subfamily or this subfamily. <laughs> What subfamilies they belong to, what subfamilies they belong to, what subfamilies they belong to. And whether there were more bees here that belong to these subfamilies compared to these. Does that make sense? Because we don't have a whole lot of time. And so you have to do a lot of, uh, I was much slimmer here. Oh my gosh. Anyway. And the answer is no. There's no nepotism. So the presence of a full sister among the virgin queens being reared does not encourage workers to stay at home rather than to leave with the swarm. And so I, we believe that is more age-based in terms of if you're of the appropriate age, you leave with the swarm. Um, yeah, and um, there's a lot of, so there's no intercolonial nepotism uh, during colony fissioning. And I took out those, uh, actually I put them here, hold on. Oh, see, so future research, explore the role of drones. <laughs> um, uh, do a lot of work with after swarms. So all these questions you have, I have too. What kinds of nest sites are defended? Um, before we forget, we have a very active Facebook page. That you can just look at Tamu Honey Bee Lab and we have like 28 followers, eh, 2,800 <laughs> followers, <laughs> 28 followers. These are three of my five students right now. My first PhD student graduated a couple of months ago, and now he's in Arizona State. Um, and But I have here the possible reasons, because someone said, well, that makes sense. Maybe what's going on is that the king recognition rules are muted for the queens to prevent half-sister workers, which are the vast majority of bees, from withholding resources from each other, because then there would be competition. If there was true nepotism, and it hasn't been found in honeybees in the context of food sharing, swarming, um, uh, brood rearing, and we, it's probably even though the predictions based on genetic relatedness are there to have nepotism, it's probably very costly determining whether you're my full sister or my half sister, so I'm going to give you more food, or then there's going to be a lot of um, um, kind of... Uh, uh, antagonistic relationships or be behavior that will lower productivity.